my name is Helen Bullock and um, I am a fashion illustrator and a print designer from London. I'm here to talk about my experience as, um, as an artist, an illustrator and a designer and um, to tell you how it, my experience is working with clients, um, the highs and lows of such things. Um, in terms of becoming uh, an artist, it was quite a late start in my life. Um, I, I didn't start studying art until I was 25. So I think a lot of people always think there's quite a rush um, to get to do what they want to be doing. But for me, it took a while. At school, I wasn't encouraged to study art. I'm told that I was pretty average. Um, so it's an idea that I gave up on. Um, I did a degree, an academic degree in history of art and philosophy. Went to New York, wanted to be an actress, many different things. Um, and then eventually I noticed that I was always designing in inverted commas, like clothes, making clothes. Um, again, making clothes very loosely, safety pinning things together, I still can't sew. Um, and I was making greetings cards, I was always drawing, and I suddenly realized I was never gonna be an actress, and actually that's, that's where I wanted to be. I wanted to be a, I wanted to be a fine artist, I think. Um, but then I went and studied at Central St. Martins um, and I was pushed towards a fashion route, which I'm really excited and happy that that happened. <laughs> First job, so once I graduated, um, there was two jobs that I had quite simultaneously. Um, First of all, I did a collaboration with um, the American company Anthropology, um, and I did a seven-piece collection, um, all of my prints based on some work that I'd done um, on my graduate collection. Everything was hand-painted, um, and they then took it into like mass production. That was, yeah, quite a exciting start for me. It was great to understand that my work, which is quite free and loose and creative, can actually get taken to a, a larger scale. I decided I wanted to be freelance. I decided I didn't want to work um, in a design house. I wanted to be able to straddle quite a lot of different um, areas in fashion and art. And I think as soon as you are in a fashion house, you're locked down, whereas I wanted to be an illustrator, I wanted to be an artist, and I wanted to be a designer. Um, so as soon as I graduated, I did the anthropology job, but then I went to Paris um, with an enormous suitcase full of all of my samples, my fabric samples. Um, I went to Dior, Chanel, Marc Jacobs, many, many places. Um, not massively successfully, I will say. Um, my work's quite personal, and I think um, as much as people responded well to it, it's hard to fit directly into a fashion house with what I was doing. But um, I had one stroke of luck and um, started to do some scarf designs for Louis Vuitton. So those are my first two starting points. Well, I mean, the refusals were very positive. So um, when I take my work with me, um, the responses were always great. People were impressed and it just wasn't what they were used to seeing. Um, and there was, there was really, a few times when it was about to happen. At Chanel, it was amazing. They were like, right, we're gonna do the Arts Metier collection with you. It's gonna happen like in two months time. But then nothing. That's what life as, a, as an artist, as a freelancer kind of becomes a lot. There's often opportunities and excitement and it doesn't eventually happen because things change. 
and you just have to be quite resilient with that. I think at the start, um, it takes years. It took me three to four years, I think, before I wasn't having to knock on doors and feel quite desperate. Um, but you just can't, you can't give up and you can't take it personally. Um, but for me, the refusals weren't too much of a knock because it was always received well. But you have to, you have to be resilient. People will say no. Some people are very lucky and it happens straight away. Instagram catapults you into fame, who knows? Um, but for me, there was always, you know, it was a slow move forward, but it was, I, I didn't want to do anything else. So, and I also believed and still do very much believe in my work. So um, I think it's worth, continuing. I think in terms of finding clients, I think the first thing you have to do is actually decide who you want to work for. Um, I'm constantly revising the list of my dream clients because it's quite vast. There's so many people, houses, labels, companies out there. Give yourself, um, give yourself some aims, first of all. Um, once I have that list, then it's a matter of investigating, um, trying to track down the, the person that you need to speak to. Um, first thing I do now, now I've got more of a network, um, I speak to friends and other people that I know within the industry and ask if, if they can put me in touch with anybody. Um, so when you're starting out, maybe you help each other out a lot. So yeah, that's my first put of call, my contacts, my network. Um, then I go on LinkedIn, actually, and I try and track people down that way. Um, a lot of Googling and online researching. I go on Instagram. I'm just like tracking the right person down. Um, I think the mistake that people sometimes make is that they email. For me, my advice is the first thing that you should do is um, do a phone call introduction um, because emails can very easily get lost. So as soon as I've tracked down the right person within the company, for me, I've found that is, I often go to the PR agency or sometimes there's, um, uh, there's a, a job title where a, um, some, an employer will be looking after special talent, so they'll be the person to contact in terms of collaborations. So I call them up and I say that I'd like to introduce myself and my work, and then I get their direct email, and then I send my work to them. And if you're lucky, something happens. If you're not lucky, you've started a conversation. And so, uh, I, if I don't, if I'm not successful the first time around, a few months later, three months later, six months later, I'll send another email. Hello, remember me? <laughs> Here's a, an update of my of the work that I've been doing recently, and that's genuinely how I've I've got work. I, I sometimes I reach out to people on Instagram. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I know this is unprofessional, but can I have your email? Um, yeah, you've got to be quite ballsy. You've got to be bold, basically. And this is part of your job. Once you finally get your job, as a, as a new designer, as a young artist, people want you to do a lot of free work. And I definitely did too much. Um, but I was also teaching on the side. So that was what was funding my existence. And so I could afford to do some jobs. And at the start, I just felt very grateful. I was like, oh my goodness, someone wants to use my work or someone wants to, especially with illustration, with fashion design, it was different because there's more of a product and there's more of an exchange perhaps. Um, but when you're doing artwork, um, for online publications, it's very easy not to feel there's a transaction because it's not a physical thing, perhaps. Um, 
and the whole element of just feeling grateful, like, yay, someone's giving me a chance. But what I would always say, which I never thought to do, people won't bring up money. If they don't bring up money, directly ask, is there a budget for this? Um, if they say no, say, can you at least cover my materials? And then you have to decide if they say no, if everything is no, then I think you have to decide whether it is worth doing because exposure is a thing, definitely, but I think it's, I think that's being abused a lot. And I think people don't talk about that and I have a real problem with that. <laughs> so I, I still now get asked, like I feel like I'm established and I still get asked to do things for free and big companies, I won't name names, but very big companies. I managed to negotiate a necklace out of it, which, you know, I wear a lot. I'm very grateful and I'm not grateful. <laughs> I, I love my necklace, but um, but I had the conversation with them and I, I told them that it wasn't okay, that I wasn't gonna get any money. And eventually the second project I did with them as a result of that, there was money. So I just wanna say, don't feel too grateful and um, bring, up, bring up the idea of money as soon as you can within a, within a conversation. That's just important for me, for you to know. <laughs> I mean, I think in terms of in terms of my education, um, I feel really privileged because it wasn't something that I'd necessarily planned to to do. I'd already done one degree. I thought doing a short course would have been enough, but I got immersed in the whole situation. At that time, it wasn't massively expensive, so it was a luxury which I'm really grateful for. But I think now, and this wasn't happening, this was, um, uh, this was in 2011 when I graduated. So there wasn't online courses. They didn't, you know, as far as I was aware, things like that didn't exist. So I think it's really great that these platforms are now available. I think that they're happening so much more where you can get insights from professionals. Um, where you don't have to be in a certain location to learn. So I think it's great that it's opening things up to a much wider audience. And also, I think people are more and more scared perhaps to, to kind of commit to a creative lifestyle or career or education, I guess, because of the, you know, the climate, the economic and political climate is, is difficult right now. And yeah, it's maybe something that people can't commit to. So being able to do it within your own time, within your own country, I think it's going to help a lot more people realise their dreams and their potentials. So yeah, I think that's great. Very exciting. <laughs>